you, all persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Case number 18-5331, Jeremy Pinson, a balance versus United States Department of Justice et al. Mr. Shelley, court appointed amicus curiae for the appellant. Mr. Pfaffenroth for the appellee. Good morning, Mr. Shelley. You may proceed. Good morning and may it please the court, I've reserved uh, two minutes of my time for rebuttal. There are three issues presented in this appeal uh, involving informal pauperous status. Two were outlined by the court and a third arises depending on the answers to the first two. The questions are, first, under the PLRA, must IFP status be reassessed at the time each new complaint or appeal is filed? The answer to that is yes, though with some qualification that I will explain. The issue is, must there be a nexus between the complaint's underlying claims and the assertions of imminent danger used to overcome the three strikes rule? The answer to that is no, there is no nexus requirement. And if the first two questions are answered against Pinson, then the third issue arises, and that is whether the denial of IFP status in her particular case is unconstitutional because she raises allegations involving fundamental rights. The answer to that is yes, if the court would have to get to that. I will go in order on these issues. So the first issue is assessing IFP status at the time of the appeal. There's threshold agreement between the government and the amicus on this. Both sides agree that the plain language of the PLRA requires the courts to reassess IFP status each time a new complaint or appeal is filed. The key case is Williams from the Ninth Circuit, really the only case to have addressed this, and, and it addressed it thoroughly going through the, the plain language of the statute. So, uh, so again, there is initial agreement between the government and the amicus that um, that IFP status should be assessed each time a new complaint is filed and each time a new appeal is filed, here being a new appeal. But that's where we then uh, part company. Um, the amicus asked the court to adopt the evidentiary presumption that the Ninth Circuit invoked in Williams. Um, here's how the presumption would work. Where a plaintiff makes a sufficient allegation of imminent danger at the district court stage, the, the plaintiff will be presumed to to continue with that allegation to the appellate stage and meet, meet the requirement of imminent danger uh, at the appellate stage through the presumption. Um, the Ninth Circuit adopted that in Williams because it makes the inquiry simple and simply administrative rather than a whole side trial about this uh, initial privilege of whether the prisoner can, can obtain IFP status. The Ninth Circuit also said it avoids more instances where a potentially wrong district court decision would remain uncorrected, which would be a bad thing. Um, the court also said there in, in Williams that it would avoid to a greater degree any unconstitutional applications um, if... Shelley, if, I, can, yeah. uh, I can certainly understand adopting an assumption if, say, the appeal is just a couple of months presumption. If the appeal is just a couple of months after the district court proceedings, but if it's a year or so later, why would, why would we make such a presumption? Uh, in fact, wouldn't it be inconsistent with the plain language of the statute? Well, I don't think it's uh, at all inconsistent with the plain language of the statute to have a presumption system because the, the statute uh, requires a factual inquiry. And by requiring a factual inquiry, it... But if, it, we, but if, we, if we agree with you that, uh, that the court only looks at the pleading at the claims of the prisoner and accept that it's true, what's, what's the problem? With, why do you need a presumption? And there would be no mini trial. We would just look at the new, the court would just look at the new allegations and, and based on our caseload, presume those are true and make a judgment based on the allegations at the time of the, of the appeal. Why is that a problem? Well, I, uh, oftentimes the allegations, both at the district court level and at the appellate level, uh, involve sort of involve continuous and continuing patterns of conduct, and therefore, well, but that's uh, the beginning point. all the prisoner has to do is read the them. It's it's true, uh, and uh, for instance, in this case, Pinson has realleged those by, for instance, in the uh, notice of appeal that. Pinson filed, she specifically said that uh, IFP status should be granted to her again on this appeal based on the ruling 
of this court a year earlier, uh, which is an indication, at least an implicit indication of adoption of the same continuing pattern. Um, so uh, I think uh, if there is a great deal of time between one between one period, uh, the district court level and the Court of Appeals, uh, I suppose the presumption at that point would be more in question. Um, and in order to hold the presumption, the prisoner might have to uh, say more on appeal than nothing. But I will note that in Pinson's case in the Ninth Circuit, for instance, there was a great delay between the district court level and the Court of Appeals level, and the court did adopt a, a simple presumption saying, you had, you had the status below, you get it here. Um, and at least here, if we start with the presumption, um, the record, which can be substantial at the district court, court level, can automatically be incorporated into the Court of Appeals level. Um, and given that the prisoners are pro se almost all the time, uh, lessening the burden on them uh, on, on having to remake the wheel at the Court of Appeals level is, is a development that, that I think would be consistent with the statute. Um, here the presumption is satisfied uh, and uh, the, just by reviewing the factual allegations in the background. Can you prevail here without a presumption? Uh, yes, uh, we can prevail without a presumption because what the court should do is determine whether Pinson was in imminent danger at the time of the appeal by looking at all, the whole record. It, it's, the court's not limited to any specific documents. The court um, can look at any, as Simani says, the court can look at any document that discusses the timely uh, imminent danger uh, that's at issue. So you could look, what Pinson has done is created a... a does she allege a, a really imminent danger? in terms of the statute and in the allegations we have before us. She says prison's a dangerous place to be for a person of my sort, but anything imminent is alleged in there? Uh, yes, uh, and not only was it imminent, but it occurred. Uh, it occurred, and we know that... No, it occurred. That, it occurred. That's fine. But imminent means likely to occur. It doesn't mean having occurred. Is there anything that suggests an imminent danger here? What I mean by it occurred is it occurred after the notice of appeal. So you had assaults that occurred before the notice of appeal. You had assaults that occurred after the notice of appeal. And what what Pinson has stated is that starting as far back as 2008, the pattern begins. What, what begins is she's an informant helping the government. Uh, she's helped unionize prisoners. She's helped the government investigate rape allegations in prison. And as a result of that, over a period of time, she's become... Uh, endangered within the prison system. Right. Now, that, that would bring us to the question of, of nexus, which I know you are taking the position, as we directed, that there is not a nexus requirement, as we suggested, but assuming there is a nexus requirement, is there any nexus here between the relief prayed and the imminent danger alleged? Yes, there is a nexus. There is there is full nexus. Um, and so Pinson meets... Uh, meets the nexus requirement through two ways. All right, what is the relief prayed? So the relief, uh, so one of the sets of claims is to correct false information in her records uh, that the BOP, I will call them culprits as she, she, she puts it, are masked in, in the records and as a result avoid discipline. That's this one set of allegations to, to correct the records and add, um, and add truth to, to the records. That's connected to the assaults because the BOP isn't stopping them uh, within the prison because these people, the BOP individuals are never identified because the, the records are never corrected and are improper and actually falsified. The second set of allegations, there are first and eighth amendment claims in the amended complaint seeking damages for the BOP retaliating against Pinson for suing the government and unionizing and even- Well, damages, damages will not help him in a danger, will it? How, yeah, how does damages, have damages for price tax have a nexus to the prevention of the imminent danger, protection against imminent danger? Sure. Damages are designed to deter. The damage, if, if the BOP prisoners... And damages are designed to make whole. In addition to, to having, the, having the purpose of uh, causing the individuals who pay the damage to stop doing it. Now, no case has said that the imminent danger exception applies only if the plaintiff seeks injunctive relief, and that's what the government would have to have, to have the statute read, uh, and that's not in the statute. But a, a damages allegation for, for prison conditions 
um, will, I, I would argue, um, assist in stopping the prison conditions because the people causing it, the BOP, would have to pay. So I see that I'm into my rebuttal time, so uh, I have no, well, uh, wait, leave I the we may yes, have sure. a, We may have. Uh, Judge Sintel, did you have another question about that subject? No, I know, I know no more questions. Okay. Uh, uh, Judge Rao, did you have any questions about the two statutory issues before I ask my question about the constitutional question? Yes, actually I did. I did have a question um, about the nexus requirement. Um, I was wondering if you could help me understand how, I mean, on your view that there um, should not be a nexus requirement, um, how can you read the statute without a nexus requirement in a way that the exception for imminent danger doesn't swallow the three strikes rule? Yeah. So, uh, there is, uh, on the face of the statute, there is, there is no nexus requirement of statute. And uh, Congress, as the, as the court said in one of it, this court has said in one of its cases, thought the thought that there would be um, that most of these cases would be about prison conditions. And so, I think you can assume that Congress thought there would automatically be a nexus uh, in in the cases because the imminent danger would be the prison conditions, and the the claim would be about halting or getting damages for the prison, the prison conditions. So the vast majority of cases, there, there would be the nexus even without it being stated in the, in the um, statute. So it doesn't swallow the rule to allow additional cases, some marginal cases that don't meet the nexus requirement into, uh, into the universe. Um, and in fact, you can, Congress you could think Congress would think it would be very unworkable to put a nexus requirement in. How much nexus would there have to be? Would all the claims have to have nexus? Would there be pendant nexus for some of the claims as opposed to some of the others? And given that Congress thought that the, the statute was really designed, uh, would really be, uh, the prisoners were really filing cases mostly about prison conditions, and you could assume imminent danger connection in those. In those. Uh, it really doesn't swallow the rule. Sort of swallows the whole statute, doesn't it? Uh, I don't. I don't believe so because if, if um, you're if you're admitting that most of the claims are going to be about prison conditions, uh, and if you're claiming that that's sufficient to meet that first step of the nexus, uh, then you're admitting that most of the cases are going to get past the IFP. So it's going to swallow that whole section, isn't it? Well, if there's imminent, if if there's sufficiently serious uh, conditions. Okay. It wouldn't if they're if they're if if we're talking about something very minimal, there wouldn't be any IFP status in that situation because you wouldn't be in imminent danger of serious bodily injury or serious physical okay. injury. Um, Mr. Shelley, I want to ask you about your as applied um, constitutional claim. Um, so your claim is is that the three strikes rule is unconstitutional because <laughs> it bars her from pursuing her First and Eighth Amendment claims, right? That, that's right. Correct, yes. Yeah. But this, this is an appeal from the, this is an interlocutory appeal from the denial of a preliminary injunction. And the claim your client, uh, not your client, I'm sorry, the claim Pinson has made in support of a preliminary injunction is not a First or Eighth Amendment claim, but a denial of access to the courts. She's claiming <laughs> stamps so, so from where, from from our perspective now, from this court's perspective, the first and eight, not only are the first and eighth amendment claims not not before us, but but this this is just the denial of a preliminary injunction. It's an interlocutory appeal. The merits of the of the access claims are still before the court. So, yes. so, well, and the reason I ask that question, you know, is that is that we've we've made this court's made clear in Brody and other cases that that uh, to raise a constitutional issue, the claim has to be completely foreclosed, completely foreclosed, and the and Pinson can still pursue her underlying uh, both access to court and. Um, uh, Judge Taylor, the, the, the third preliminary, I believe it was the third preliminary injunction request that was denied uh, by the district court uh, involved Pinson's allegation that the government was um, 
denying her access to stamps, paralegals, right. law library, legal mail. Right. Uh, all of those uh, implicate the First Amendment right to right to petition your government for grievances, which is part of the, part of the basis, I think, for the the right of access to the courts. And so that that issue. The First Amendment issue about access to the courts and the right to petition the government for grievances is at issue in that preliminary injunction request. And 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 Pinson would argue and and argues that she can't properly access the courts. She can't pursue her case, even this case, because she can't she can't get the materials. Yeah. Okay. I I, I understand. That's a good point. Uh, I understand that. But what about my second concern? This is just an interlocutory appeal, and the merits of all of these are still before the district court. So she hasn't been completely. I'm trying to look for the language. Um, uh, 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 in other words, in, in Browdy's words, the plaintiff can quote still meaningfully quote still meaning meaningfully press her underlying claim. In the in the third again the third preliminary injunction request, Pinson says she cannot she cannot in this no, case she no, can't. Yeah, she, she, well, let me just interrupt. Because, sorry, but uh, yeah. it, all the district court found, I think, was that she's unlikely to succeed on the merits. She still has her merits claim in the district court, right? If, in other words, if, if she can't pursue this appeal, in fact, she brought this interlocutory appeal before she pursued the merits of her case, correct? In other words, the preliminary injunction was denied, and instead of saying, okay, let's go on to the merits, she filed this interlocutory appeal. If we rule that she can't pursue the interlocutory appeal, she still has her merits claim before the district court. So, in other words, under Brody, the claim hasn't been completely precluded. Well, she, she, argue, she argues it is because she no, can't pursue I, the merits I, claim. Well, okay, let me try once more. Yeah, sure. <laughs> she can pursue it in the district court uh, now because with the preliminary injunction issue out of the way, she can now pursue the merits. That is, she can now argue in the district court that um, that the uh, uh, prison's denial of stamps, access to the library, and other things is precluding her from pursuing her first and eighth amendment claim. She has that issue live in the district court right now. Isn't that true? Yes, but she can't meaningfully pursue it because she doesn't have stamps, paralegals, law library, and legal mail. In other words, while the claim is alive in the district court and can get to the merits, her point is I can't possibly – she doesn't have counsel, and she can't possibly present her case because she lost her preliminary injunction request. Okay. She can't file – she can't file the paper. She can't present legal arguments because she has no access to the paralegal or the law library. So it's it's as if the claim through the preliminary injunction denial has been defeated already. And that's why she might might well lose in the district court, in which case she would have an appeal on the merits. And this court would then be confronted directly with the question of whether she's been absolutely barred from pursuing her claim. Yes, and, and we just don't know that yet. Justice it's delayed is justice denied, she, she argues. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, sure. Judge Sintel, Judge Rabb, did you have any further questions? No, I just want to join your thanks to the amici for his participation. Okay. Uh, and thank you. Um, uh, yes. Uh, I was actually going to thank him after he argued. I thought you'd already thanked him. No, no, he has to complete his second <laughs> Whenever you thank him, I'll thank him, too. He has to argue. I'll thank take you. as many as you can get. Can <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's hear from the government. <laughs> Go ahead. Good morning. May it please the court, Peter Fafnoff for the government. Yeah. Um, so as, as Amicus was just arguing, you know, really the core questions here are whether or not a presumption applies. Um, he he invokes the Ninth Circuit's decision in Williams and says that the presumption ought to be uh, applied here as well because it's a quote-unquote simple approach. Um, but I think that that really skirts the Court of Appeals' role and responsibility under the PLRA to ensure that, in fact, an imminent danger does exist at the time the notice of appeal has been filed. And sometimes, you know, taking the simple path is not the right path. And uh, as I think Judge Tatel was suggesting in, in his questions, the 
it is essential and not that that much to ask, frankly, for a prisoner litigant to show that at the time the notice of appeal is filed, whether the person does that in order to show cause response or in the notice of appeal or some other contemporaneous filing, that in fact an imminent danger does exist at that time and doesn't just try to import the injury from an earlier phase. Um, you know, furthermore, I think the, the most important question presented here really does relate to the nexus requirement. As Judge Santel was correctly noting, you know, the without a nexus requirement, really the entire, I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback. Um, it really the entire uh, IFP process under the PLRA would be, you know, removed effectively from the, the statute books because effectively um, the, the injury would um, not need to be shown uh, to have it to be remediable through the lawsuit. We see many, many lawsuits brought by prisoners that have nothing to do with the actual prison conditions or the imminent danger that they allege. Um, and in fact, to some degree, uh, the cases that the court is considering this morning fall along those lines. So it's important that the that the actual nexus be required as a number of other circuits have held, some in published decisions, some in unpublished decisions, but their analysis is persuasive. Hello? Yes. Okay, if the court has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. No questions. Um, how exactly would you formulate the nexus requirement? What precisely should we be looking for in terms of a nexus? I, I think that the Second Circuit's approach in Pettis makes the most sense. It does make sense that the analysis goes claim by claim because you don't want to have a grab bag of claims, some of which come along for the ride, uh, even though they have nothing to do with the imminent danger that the lawsuit according to the PLRA's purpose and its text ought to be remediating. Um, so look for whether or not the injury in fact, akin to a standing analysis, uh, is in fact uh, appropriately set forth, and then whether or not that injury in fact would be remediable by the claim in question. If the court has nothing further, I'm happy to uh, rest on our briefs. No question, and I had my phone on mute. Sorry. <laughs> my, 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 my question was, um, do we have to decide? I, I realize we, the, the question of whether the statute allows, permits a nexus requirement is before us, but do we have to define the precise nature of that requirement? I mean, if, if we don't think there's any nexus at all, why, do, why, does, why do we have to go any further in this case? In this court, you, in this case, you do not need to go further because uh, I believe it's pretty clear in, in the government's view that Tinson does not meet a light nexus, a substantial nexus. There's just really no nexus between the PI issues that are before the court currently and the dangers that have been asserted by amicus, which I'll point out really are not uh, asserted by by Pinson as of the time of the filing of the notice of appeal, but rather have sort of been constructed from a variety of other records over a course of many years. And that, that really defies the principles underlying the need that the, that the injury be quote unquote imminent. Um, and, and looking back at filings from, as Amicus noted, 2008 and forward. I mean, that's, that's really, uh, that un <laughs> defies the term eminence. Uh, any further questions, Judge Rao, Judge Sintel? Uh, no questions. Okay, Mr. Shelley, uh, we took you well over your time. You can take an extra minute if you'd like. Oh, and thank you, Your Honor. And I'm gonna use up your minute, well, I'm not. I'm gonna use up my own minute. Would you respond to uh, this last 
question about whether we even have to define the nexus, but, but assuming there is a nexus requirement, um, given given the given her and assuming we require allegations of imminent harm at the time of the appeal, why do we have to define uh, the requirement any further? In other words. Uh, if you, if you have a nexus requirement, uh, I don't. You, you wouldn't have to define define it very much because, as I, as we've said in our brief, Pin, Pinson meets Pinson meets the, the nexus requirement. Um, while Mr. Uh, while my colleague says that that there's uh, there's no imminence because the allegations begin in 2008. In fact, they, what they show is a pattern that began in 2008 and continues well on beyond this case even. And, and so in that instance, there is uh, – the other thing I'd like to say in, in Nexus is the issue's been avoided in nearly every case that, that's, been, that's been reported. And for instance, the Vandiver case in the Sixth Circuit avoided it because there is Nexus in nearly all these cases. So finding uh, – you know, so insisting on, on looking at Nexus is not going to suddenly throw into court a whole bunch of cases that otherwise weren't in the court already. Um, and given that the statute doesn't have a nexus requirement and given the unworkability of one, for instance, the Second Circuit actually after, um, after the case uh, that was mentioned held that you don't need nexus with every single claim. You only need nexus with one claim and the other ones come along pendently. So there's a lot, there's a lot to determine once you bring into the statute a nexus requirement, including what should it look like. And, you know, the Second Circuit pulled out of Whole, you know, just drafted drafted up one that's nowhere in the statute based on a standing requirement, and there's no indication from Congress. Well, the that standing discussion it. was by way of analogy, actually, wasn't it? It was. It she was didn't say she didn't say that you had to have exactly standing. She said that, that there is an analogy there in the causation and remediability provisions, right? But, Correct, but it's just one okay. it's one construct built on another construct that isn't in the statute in the first place. So once you delve into finding a nexus requirement, you're going to have to define what it should look like through analogies. You're going to have to define whether it's pendant, and there's not a necessity for that in, given given the types of cases okay. that are usually filed. So I thank the court. Well, thank you, Mr. Shelley. Do you want to just move right into your arguments on behalf of um, of um, Gorby. Yes. We'll envision you sitting down at the table and getting back up. Okay, with a, with a different staff in hand. Um, yeah. So uh, there are two issues in this case. The nexus issue is also present in, in Gorby's case, and that's the second issue. But the first issue is slightly different than the first issue in, in the Pinson case. And the first issue is, can the court consider a prisoner's allegations raised for the first time on appeal when determining application of the imminent danger exception for the appeal. And again, at the start of that issue, at the threshold, there's not dispute among the parties that the court can and should consider new allegations raised on appeal. Um, briefly, the statute requires the court to assess whether when appealing in the present tense, when appealing a judgment, the prisoner has three strikes, and if the prisoner is in imminent danger of serious physical injury, then he or she will be allowed to proceed in form of pauperous. The use of the present tense at both the beginning, appealing a judgment, and at the end of the imminent danger exception is an imminent danger indicates that the circumstances that exist at the time of the appeal are what matters. Um, again, the Ninth Circuit addressed this in the Williams case, the only case uh, on point in it, and held that the facts at the time of the appeal are what matters, and it really would make no sense to disallow new facts alleged on appeal when the whole goal is to determine what are the circumstances on appeal. So there is agreement that, that uh, between uh, myself and the government uh, uh, on the ability to consider new facts and circumstances on appeal. In fact, that's the only thing that should be considered is what, uh, considered is what is, are the circumstances at the time of the appeal. But then we have a series of disputes again uh, with the government. So the first one is, is again, about this presumption uh, about should, should the district court, the facts uh, at the time of the district court filing be considered on appeal. And uh, this is really actually uh, much ado about nothing because uh, Gorby in his show cause response in the Court of Appeals repeated all the, uh, all the same facts. Um, so you don't need to get into the presumption so much at all. 
Um, instead, you just really can look at the facts that, that he uh, has alleged in his show cause response and also in his brief in this case. Then there's. Am I right? That didn't, a, didn't a district court in a different district address these same claims and find they didn't present a threat of imminent harm? Yes, there was. What do we do with that? Well, uh, so, even, if we, even if we accept prisoners' claims as true, uh, for purposes of this, what about a district court decision that you know has already rejected them? Yes, so the district court, there's a district court in Maryland that initially, yeah. Maryland. yes, in Maryland that initially awarded Gorby informal pauper status, but later revoked it. And you should reject that court that court's decision because it held Gorby to too high a standard for for showing uh, imminent danger. Um, what it did was it demanded objective medical evidence. Uh, rather than just simply liberally construing his allegations of imminent danger, which is the Mitchell's the standard in this circuit under Mitchell is liberally construed the allegations, and instead that court that awarded him more proper that late revoked it because he didn't come up with any objective medical evidence, and instead the government started producing uh, material that the court thought undermined Gorby's uh, Gorby's position. But this court. The court doesn't allow, doesn't allow the government to do that. It's the, the determination under Mitchell. Uh, uh, how do you say that the government is not allowed to produce evidence on the question? No, under Asimani and also under the, um, the, the obviously Ninth Circuit doesn't govern here, but the Ninth Circuit addressed this point too in the Williams case. The issue is based on a liberal view of the allegations that the prisoner has presented. Is he is he in imminent danger of serious bodily yeah, injury? That, that gets the first, in the first instance. That's fine. But why then is the government not permitted to uh, establish that, that that it's perjury, for example, uh, and get the status revoked? I, I, I don't understand that to be compelled by the precedent. But why well, is it? Well, well, what the statute says is that if if it becomes clear that the, elsewhere that the prisoner is not poor, then the court can revoke the court can revoke uh, informal pauper status. But exactly. it doesn't say it doesn't say anywhere if later the court the court you know based on additional evidence as opposed to the lens of looking through the allegations that the plaintiff has presented liberally construed. Uh, if later on the court finds on the merits, for instance, some evidence that undermines things, there's nothing in the statute. That Does that says, make a lot of sense? That the court can revoke if it finds out by accident, but not if the, if the, if the government can't present evidence to get it there. Does, it does. Can it, you imagine an opinion be, really saying that, counsel? Yes, because okay. it, there are there are two of them. <laughs> there are two of them. I think Asimani come, uh, says that, but and then Williams says it even more even more clearly. And the reason is because. This is just a screening device at the very beginning of a case. It's to determine whether the prisoner should have the privilege of filing uh, in, in, through installment payments as opposed to, uh, through, <laughs> as opposed to paying the, the, the whole fee. And as a result, it shouldn't be turned into a mini trial. With, I mean, you can see in this case, for instance, the amount uh, the government took uh, – all but one word uh, of his word allowance in order to argue that uh, 13,000 words in order to ar argue that Gorby isn't um, authorized f for informal pauper status. And this is after proceedings that took a, many months already, evidence going back and forth. And this is to determine a screening device as to whether just the case should go forward. If it's being abused and if the what's really going on here is a frivolous type of claim or argument, then there are other mechanisms in the PLRA for the court to for the court to um, for the court to, dis to, to dismiss the case, it shouldn't use the 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 administrative you know finding of informal pauper status to accomplish all of that. And th really, I think what's going on in the government's brief is they're trying to erect an evidentiary burden for informal pauper status that isn't con that is completely inconsistent with this court's prior precedents. For instance. They want to put a summary judgment burden on the prisoner to show in form of pauper status. They want to have a presumption against the prisoner and in favor of the government. They want to allow the government to contest the IFP, IFP allegations on the merits. They want to allow an opportunity for the appellate court to enlist the district court to develop the facts. They want to consider facts showing that the danger abated since the notice of appeal. 
All these elements are foreclosed by Mitchell, Asimani, and actually Pinson's earliest case, which say you look at the, just the allegations of imminent danger presented by the plaintiff, you liberally construe them, and you don't look to events that may have abated afterwards. Pinson specifically says that. So there's very high burden that the government wants to put on, and that the, that the District of Maryland actually put on Gorby. Um, it, it's not consistent with this court's cases. So really what it boils down to then are, are the dangers that uh, Gorby has alleged uh, for, uh, for informal pauper status, are they imminent and sufficiently serious? Uh, and they are. There are two principal dangers. The first is the danger of being in a top bunk, uh, given his physical condition. And the second is that he's alleged ineffectively treated glaucoma. What relief did he pray in his complaint, counsel? Uh, so the relief that Orby wants is his claims are that he wants damages. Again, to deter, the, to deter certain conduct. His main issue is he wants, I think he sought $800,000 in damages against yes. the United States for the BOP's bad acts and for, the, for, for the, a conspiracy the BOP has. But that, except for your deterrence theory, that does not in any way protect against the alleged imminent danger of falling out of bunk again, does it? Well, it, it does, in this, because um, what, Gorby, what Gorby has presented in his complaint are allegations against judges, but also allegations against the BOP. His spe the specific relief he's asked for is, is damages. But in reality, the district judge, no, giving, the, giving the complaint a liberal construction, uh, and under Rule 54, actually, the district judge is required to give him all of the relief he's entitled to, given his allegations, even if he didn't ask for it. And given his allegations about being improperly placed in a, in a top bunk that uh, he shouldn't have been, and given, given his untreated glaucoma, the court could give an injunction. Um, he hasn't, I mean, he's not represented, he's pro se again, and he's asked for money, but there's nothing to prevent the court from giving him the injunction that, that would provide the close connection I think that Judge Santel you're looking, you're looking for. Um, the last thing I'd point out is that on the idea of being in a top bunk given his physical condition, given his bad knees, his broken wrists, um, there are several cases we cite in our brief um, noting that, uh, noting that, that the previous courts have held exactly this, that being in a top bunk is uh, imminent danger, uh, and I think those are at uh, those are at particularly uh, page 32 in our brief. And then on the untreated glaucoma, pages 21 through 25, excuse me, 51 and 52 of our brief, those show also that those are um, those are imminent danger. So I gather my time is up. Thank you again, Mr. Shelley. Uh, sure. We'll hear from the government, Mr. Good morning again, uh, Peter Kravnoff for the government. So uh, my colleague just basically said that uh, the court should allow the evisceration of the three strikes rule as a component of the PLRA because there are other components of the PLRA that can guard against litigation abuses by prisoners. The three strikes rule is there for a reason and this court should give effect to all parts of the statute if possible. And adopting a construction that effectively reads the three strikes rule and the out of the, out of the statute would not be proper. Um, furthermore, I would note that although the Fourth Circuit's decision is just a line or so, it did in fact affirm the District of Maryland's rejection of uh, of all of the imminent harms that were alleged here, um, including uh, specifically uh, the analysis in the District of Maryland decision that went up on appeal, focused more extensively on the, what about, the top bunk assignment. What, what about Go ahead. Kelly's point that the district court used a much too rigorous standard, required objective evidence? What, what about that? Well, I, I, one point I'd like to make is that well, obviously, Asimani says what it does. Asimani is in some tension, however, with the earlier decision in Mitchell. Asimani is 2015 and Mitchell is 2009. Uh, and in Mitchell, this court said, 
it should make its IFP decisions based upon as much information as it can gather. Right, but that, and was, whether, that was about whether how many how many strikes there were, wasn't it? It, it was, Your Honor. Right, but that's a different uh, question, right? <clears throat> Your Honor, this case and in demonstrates. Fact, didn't Mitchell go, ahead. go on to say? Didn't Mitchell? I don't. Didn't Mitchell go on to say that we we do treat the prisoners' claims as true? Your Honor, treating them as true is one thing, but treating them as true when the court is also presented with evidence which shows that they are in fact not true is a different analysis. Right. You mean the district court, the Maryland decision? I, I suppose, frankly, in this in this appeal, we've also uh, put forward the evidence uh, that the court asked for. At least I inferred when we received a, a request for us to respond to Mr. Gorby's show cause response. Um, you know, we we pointed the this court to numerous filings that had been offered in the District of Maryland, which showed that a number of his allegations were not factually accurate. So we, we're not only relying upon the district court's decision itself, which I agree uh, should be considered perhaps different than the evidence that BOP itself invited the court's attention to, but that evidence itself shouldn't just be ignored where the court is aware of it. I mean, Keep going. go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I didn't have another question. Feel free. Okay. Take I, I take your point. I, yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it, it just, the court should not countenance being abused. And the evidence here does show that this court should not turn a blind eye to the fact that Mr. Gorby is an incredibly experienced litigant who's brought countless lawsuits nationwide and who ha seems to be trying out and trying to find, you know, a variety of imminent harm allegations that he can use in order to thread the three strikes needle every time. And the fact of the matter is, uh, I feel very sorry for Mr. Gorby that he has glaucoma, but it is not the case as he asserts that BOP is ignoring it. His very own show cause response offered in this proceeding says, oh, I haven't been seen by an optometric in a year. And then a line or two later, he says, and I saw optometric Robert Mitcher, you know, he, I think this is in October 2018, which would have been a month or two before he filed this notice of the deal. And he, he took issue with the fact that the Utilization Review Committee said he didn't need to go see an, op, an outside ophthalmologist right then because the only question was, could they find another set of eye drops to which he would not have side effects? And in fact, the Utilization Review Committee said, go and please meet with your primary care physician and the pharmacist, and let's see what we can do internally before you see an outside physician. And then- Let me just ask you two questions about this. Number yes. One, it sounds like, I mean, if we were to agree with you about all of this, you would have the courts getting into a little mini trial over this, which I think is exactly what we're not supposed to do. But more importantly, at least in this case, if we agree with you, there's no nexus. Do, why do we even have to address this question? I agree, Your Honor, if there's no nexus, you do not need to get into these factual problems. The court, however, is going to continue to be confronted with prisoners who are telling half-truths or untruths in order to try and thread the three strikes needle. And if, if that is permitted to continue where the court is aware that uh, a prisoner is playing fast and loose with the truth, that does a disservice to the courts and imposes the very burden on court resources that the Prison Litigation Reform Act was supposed to address. If the court has nothing further, Judge, I would ask that the decision be affirmed. Do either of you have any questions? No questions. I have questions. Okay. Mr. Shelley, you can take one minute. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, 
Gorby's a prisoner who has been mistreated, and it's not surprising that he has filed many cases, and he also feels as though no one responds to to his allegations, and that's the basis for his complaint. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it, he shouldn't be denied in form of pauper status just because of the government's view of him. His case should be determined based on what he, his IFP status should be determined based on the allegations that existed, that he made, existing at the time of the appeal. And Mitchell says exactly this. It says to construe his allegations liberally in his favor as true. In fact, Mitchell, Mitchell rejected even an Iqbal standard to, to apply there. It's even less than an Iqbal standard, and the government would never be able to introduce evidence in, in a motion, on a motion to dismiss under Iqbal, for instance, under a 12B6 motion, yet it wants to in, in, incorporate all sorts of evidence in this situation. Um, the last thing I would say is on the nexus. Um, we put it in our reply brief this way. What these underlying claims against the judges are that the judges have construed the three strikes rule too constrictively and out of sync with the statutory text, which in turn artificially ends his lawsuits, which in turn leaves unchecked and emboldens BOP officials who continuously keep him in physical danger due to his, his placement in the top book and leaving his glaucoma untreated. One thing leads to another, and there would be nexus even in this case. And, and one final point, if I can squeeze it in, is that the government, the, yes, the government wants to say uh, it's treated, it's treated uh, the glaucoma, and therefore the glaucoma wasn't in imminent danger. But at the time, what they do is introduce facts where they treated the glaucoma after he filed his notice of appeal. And the only thing that, ma and Gorby disputes that anyway, that the treatment was it in any manner uh, sufficient. But what matters is that it was untreated and he was in imminent danger of blindness at the time of the filing of the notice of appeal. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Shelley, you were appointed by the court to serve as amicus in both of these cases. You've been extremely helpful to us and we are grateful to you for your work. Case thank you, Your submitted. Honor. Please call the next case. Case number 19-5362. Ahmed Ali Mustana, individually and as next friend of Hoda Mustana and minor Joe Doe, initials AM, appellant, versus Michael R. Pompeo in his official capacity as Secretary of the Department of State at all. Ms. Jump for the appellant, Mr. Stewart for the appellee. Good morning, Ms. Jump. You may proceed. Good morning, and thank you, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. You know, I did try to get Mr. Shelley to cover this one for me as well, but apparently two is his limit for the morning. <laughs> This case centers on the difference between the ability to administratively revoke a document versus revocation of citizenship status itself. And as the Supreme Court held in Trot v. Dulles, neither the Congress nor the executive, nor the judiciary, nor all three in concert may strip away birthright citizenship without the due process that's guaranteed under the Constitution. That was true when the Supreme Court held so in 1958, and it remains just as true today. There's no dispute here that Hoda Muthana was born after her father stopped working as a diplomat. But after, before the notice was received, right? That is actually in dispute, Your Honor. Uh, that it, it, she was born... Is really before us, isn't, isn't the record before us that she was born between the end of the duties and the time of the notice? Your Honor, there has been, there was some um, documentation presented at the district court by the government um, showing that the blue list was dated February um, after her birth, a couple of months after her birth, recognizing the notification. Um, so what we had before us, there's been a finding that her birth was between those critical dates, right? Uh, there's been a finding that her birth was after his duties ended. Um, and before and because, the notice was sent, right? We don't know that it was before the notice was sent, Your Honor. What Isn't, there a finding to that effect? Isn't there a finding to that effect by the district court? That is, the, the district court ha, um, did defer to the government's holding on that, or the, the government's representation. So your answer would that. be yes to my question, right? As to, the, as to the district court's decision, yes. We did ask for a discovery on that issue because we don't believe that it was established and it's in dispute, but that was the holding of the district court. We would say, however, though, that the, um, if you look at the language of Article 43 of the Vienna Convention, it is not as clear that notification is the only measure um, of when the end of duties, when the end of um, diplomatic status is triggered. 
the Article 43 contains the term inter alia as far as when the function of the diplomatic agent comes to an end, right before listing notification being received by the host state. And as we've set forth in our briefs, the um, uh, documentation behind the intent at that time was to intentionally leave it open and leave it vague. It is not restrictive, it is expansive, and that it is inter among other things. The government has argued in other cases and in other situations that diplomatic immunity ends when the duties end, and there is no dispute that the duties ended prior to Ms. Mathana's birth here. Um, I want to ask you, uh, assuming you're, assuming we, <laughs> you, assuming we, are, we all think that <laughs> this turns on on notification and nothing else. Um, in your brief, um, in your brief that. Uh, okay, the, the, one of the documents in support of the Donovan Declaration yes. was this UN termination list. And yes, Your Honor. You raised some concerns about that. Correct, um, Your Honor. It, it, you know, it contains a bunch of comprehensible handwritten notes. At least we couldn't read them. Correct. Um, uh, but, but it's dated February 5. And so uh, I don't. I don't, I don't see there's any inconsistency between that and the Donovan Declaration. Your Honor, what I would say to that is that, first of all, um, the, the, there is a date entered as of February uh, 2005, but it is, we are not clear if that's the first time that notations were entered, if that's the first time that there is an entry. We know that February 2005 is the but date the, of the, the publication. The by itself says February 5. Now, Your Honor, there's I other documents, which I'll get to in a minute, but... I don't mm -hmm. understand why this document is inconsistent with what Donovan says in his declaration. Your Honor, I believe that the inconsistency that we point to here is with the October 18, 2004 uh, letter from the Minister Council for Host Country Affairs at the first time that the Department of State was looking at, okay. at Ms. Bizana's application right. for that, a passport. That's, Ms. Jump, that's why I asked you the question. So what yes. this case really turns on? Right. Let me see if I have this right. Is whether uh, there's an inconsistency between uh, uh, between the um, between the er earlier letter, the one by Graham, and the Donovan letters. Right. That's the question. That is part of the question, Your Honor. But both of those go to revoking. Well, I would say, Your Honor, that both of those go to revoking the document of the passport and the government's right to revoke the document of the passport, not to whether the government, whether the Department of State had the right to revoke her citizenship status. The Department of State said it, it revoked her citizenship. All it did was that, as I understand it, the Department's view is that she never had citizenship and therefore it revoked the passport. Your Honor, she had, she had been issued. I guess she invoked, they revoked her passport, but I, I don't see that in here. I mean, her Your citizenship, I, I, I just see this as a revoking of the passport because, in the State Department's view, she was not a citizen. Is that wrong? Your Honor, as to revoking the passport, the document itself, that in, it, that in itself would be within the Department of State's discretion to do um, administratively. The district court's holding specifically states that Ms. Muthana was not born a U.S. citizen, and she had been previously issued two U.S. passports. She had been previously recognized by the Department of State as a United States citizen. And the district court's holding specifically says that, well, no, she's not anymore now. Um, that, so that, is that, doesn't, that doesn't really answer the question. The issuance of the passport is a function by some functionary who has no authority to stop the government from denying the citizenship later. A functionary employee of the United States government cannot stop the government from anything, can he? You're under, under uh, 22 U.S.C. 2705, a passport has the same force and effect as proof of citizenship as do certificates of naturalization or citizenship that is issued by the attorney general. So when she has had... That's not the same question. That's not the same question. An a, a incorrectly issued certificate or an incorrectly issued uh, passport can't confer citizenship. It may be evidence or proof, if you use the word, of citizenship, but that doesn't confer the citizenship. If it's found to be erroneously issued, the government's not stopped, is it, from denying the person was a citizen ever in the first place? 
Your Honor, I would say that the government is not stopped from revoking, again, the document. But once the citizenship has been recognized, the government does not... ...has been recognized by some functionary at the field level that there's no case that says that government can be stopped from anything by that level employee. I think the rule is the United States government is not stopped by the acts of its employees. Is that not... Am I wrong about that? Your Honor, it wasn't just the fact that this one individual who is the Minister Counsel for Host Country Affairs issued a letter. It's the fact that the Department of State itself, as a department issued, which, as the department which is charged with this responsibility, issued two passports to Ms. Muthana, recognizing her as a United States citizen. Yeah, but incorrectly, according to the government's position, recognizing, and what it's doing is revoking the document because it was incorrectly issued. That is the current says that uh, the current argument that they're making in your honor. I would say that the court is not required to defer to that because there's no claiming ad- deference is owed. I'm just asking if the government can't do that. Why can't wh- what would keep them from saying this was improperly issued? She's not a citizen. Yet. I would say you're under that under the, your honor under the authority of Zia V. Tillerson and, and the authority that's cited within that holding. Uh, that we, the government needs to be put to its proof to show that she is not a citizen if it's now changing her, changing its mind as to what had happened previously when she was issued two U.S. passports recognizing her as a United States citizen. And the government has not yet been put to its proof. This was a grant of a motion to dismiss, which was converted to a summary judgment with no discovery that was allowed to occur and um, no new information that came to light to the government that it did not have in 2000, late 2004 and early 2005 when it first issued her, her U.S. passport and renewed it in 2014. Can I, can I perhaps follow up on Judge Santel's question in a different way, um, which is if we assume we agree with the government that Ms. Musana was not a citizen at the time of her birth. I know you're arguing against that, but assume that for a moment. So is your position that even if she were not a citizen at birth, that she would somehow now have a citizenship status through the recognition of citizenship by the executive branch in her passport. And I guess if that's your view, I mean, do you have any support for that proposition? Are there any cases suggesting that the executive branch can confer citizenship on a person who doesn't have it under the Constitution or a statute of the United States? Your Honor, in response to that, I would say that if we compare the cases of the Hazam case and the Magnuson case, In the Hazam case, there was no dispute that the individual never should have been granted citizenship, never had a legal right to citizenship to begin with, and that the law was incorrectly applied at the time that the first passport was granted. There was no dispute in that case that that, those were the facts. The individual argued that he should be able to keep his his citizenship anyway, because once the government granted it, then in that case, they were... Um, once the government had granted that, the government was not allowed to change its mind. That is not what we're arguing here. What we're arguing here is more in line with the Magnuson case. And if you look at that, it is that there simply cannot be just a second look because they decided to take a second look and change their mind. And the government has not been put to its proof on that. Um, at this but, stage, but at a minimum, you're, you're it's premature. Fighting, you're, I think you're, you're fighting the hypothetical. I mean, if we assume she was not a citizen at birth, could she have acquired citizenship by the executive branch giving her passport. Your Honor, she could have acquired citizenship if she was not a citizenship as of the date of her birth. She would have been able to acquire citizenship in multiple other ways, but she did not because she relied on the representation and the grant and the official document from the Department of State that she was a United States citizen. Um, as with the, Mr. Mithana's older children, he would have gone through the process of getting them lawful permanent resident status, and then they became citizens later. And when Mr. Muthana himself was later naturalized, while, she, while Ms. Muthana was still a minor, um, she would have been eligible for citizenship at that point as well. She didn't pursue any of those avenues because during all of those times, she was recognized as a United States citizen. Are so we do her reliance interests create a right by the executive branch to confer citizenship on her or by the district court? or by a court to confer citizenship on Hoda Muthana? We're not saying, we're not asking the district court to confer citizenship on her or the Department of State to confer citizenship on her. What we're asking is that the status quo where she has citizenship that has been recognized be maintained until the government is put to its proof to establish otherwise, other than through a motion to dismiss, 
um, with regard with you know review of other documents, which is what has happened here. There has not been the appropriate due process to show that it was erroneously issued and should be revoked. That has not happened or, or rescinded, um, but that has not happened. That due process has not been afforded to Ms. Mazzana thus far under the facts of this case and at the status of where we are, you know, at which point the district court granted judgment and ruled her not to be a citizen as of the time of birth. That discretion is not within the, the district court and it's not within the Department of State to remove the citizenship status. They can revoke the document. 50, um, Section 1504, which the government has relied on, gives the government the, the authority to revoke a passport document if it determines, for whatever reason, that the citizenship, what, that the document was erroneously issued. But it does not. Nothing in there grants the government um, any authority or the for that matter, the courts any authority to revoke the citizenship status. Uh, that is something that is just simply not up to uh, those agencies to do, and that is what's happened here is that her status has been revoked uh, through the holding of the district court. If you look at um, 8, 8 U.S.C. 1504A, um, the sentence at the end of that is that the, the cancellation under the section of any document purporting to show the citizenship status of the person to whom it was issued shall affect only the document and not the citizenship status of the person in whose name the document was issued. And that is the um, statute which specifically refers to the Secretary of State's right to revoke a document that it that subsequently believes was erroneously obtained or illegally or fraudulently obtained. It still does not give the right to revoke the status of the citizenship, just the document. Uh, okay, unless my colleagues have any further questions. Judge Ryan, were you finished? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, no questions. Okay. We'll hear from Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Your Honor. The, uh, may it please the court. I'm Scott Stewart on behalf of the United States. In this case, the district court granted summary judgment to the government on the plaintiff's many claims that rested on the assertion that his daughter is a United States citizen. The court concluded, under the governing law and the conclusive evidence submitted by the government, Hoda Muthana is not a United, citizen, United States citizen. The district court also refused to provide the plaintiff with an advisory opinion regarding hypothetical actions that he may take that implicate federal criminal law. The district court was correct to rule for the government. This court should affirm. I'll lead, of course, with the main and central issue in this appeal, Your Honor, regarding uh, the plaintiff's diplomatic status and therefore the citizenship status of his daughter. As we've explained, this case is overdetermined in a number of ways. The Vienna Convention uh, sets forth the governing principles uh, quite clearly. The Department of State has reasonably construed those principles in, in accordance with that language, and the Department of State has in turn provided a conclusive certification uh, regarding the dispositive citizenship issue, uh, regarding the dispositive uh, diplomatic immunity uh, issue that uh, decides the citizenship question, Your Honors. Uh, in short, the analysis goes like, like this. Uh, under the plain language of the Vienna Convention, a diplomat's functions and uh, the, the functions of a diplomat end on official notification to the receiving state. Uh, when functions end, that's under Article 43, when those functions end, then immunity ceases uh, when a person leaves the country or after a reasonable time to do so. Um, and usually that can go reasonable period of 30, peri 30 days beyond unless the person's already been afforded a reasonable period. That's how the Department of State has interpreted it here, consistent with that interpretation. Mr. Donovan submitted a certification setting forth uh, the conclusive dates on which uh, the, the plaintiff possessed diplomatic status that went through early February 1995 after Ms. Muthana's birth. Under longstanding uh, Supreme Court law, law applied by other circuits more, more recently, uh, that is conclusive, that decides the question. And as we've also explained, Your Honor, as I think some of Your Honor's questions pointed out, the, the underlying contemporaneous documents also bear that out. The Cardex card makes clear that uh, Ms. Muthana was added to her father's diplomatic Cardex card. As Mr. Donovan explains, the only reason to do that would be if Mr. Muthana still retained diplomatic status at the time of her birth. That's why you, you add another member of the household to make clear that that person also enjoys <laughs> diplomatic status. And uh, given that certification, which again is based on a, a reasonable interpretation of the uh, of the uh, Vienna Convention here, Your Honors, that that certification is conclusive. The, the other courts have done similarly. Um, most recently, cases like uh, Alhamdi in the Fourth Circuit, Abdul Aziz in the Eleventh Circuit have noted noted the importance of certification. 
But I'd also just note there's a very, very long pedigree for this sort of treatment of a State Department certification, Your Honor. Um, a leading case noting, noting the importance of this is the Supreme Court's decision in In Re Baez. This is a late 19th century decision. And the court there noted uh, it was assessing the diplomatic status of someone and that, that person's amenability to suit. It looked at uh, uh, State Secretary of State certifications going back, I believe, to Secretary of State Madison. So the, the pedigree is quite long standing, and the court emphasized, the Supreme Court emphasized there, Your Honor, that the Department of State had not provided a certification attesting to the uh, putative diplomat status in that case. And it, it noted that that was quite important because, in the end of its opinion, it said, look, when a court gets that certification, it's entitled to accept that. It doesn't need to hear collateral proof. And these certifications just have a, a conclusive, decisive pedigree in the law when based on a reasonable interpretation as the one here is, Your Honor. But as we've explained, they also are corroborated by the relevant documents. If I can just note a few uh, points, and I, I think Your Honor, Your Honor's uh, already highlighted a number of, mm -hmm. of, of the responses here in, in the prior colloquy with my friend. Um, the, the, uh, the plaintiff here really did not create any plausible dispute. I, first of all, as noted, the certification is conclusive, but there were, the plaintiff had a number of assertions that were just kind of hollow and said, look, we don't know about what, what we said on the blue list. But as I believe Judge Santel, or my apologies, Judge Tatel pointed out, that document itself has a February uh, 19, 1995 date on it. The Cardex document, the Thomas record, all, all, all underscore that the critical date here, the date of official notification, is undisputed. Hey, and under the. Let me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but. Can no, I, you are. I just want to call your attention. I agree with virtually everything you say here. It's just one thing that, about this case that troubles me. And yes, Your Honor. And I want to ask you about it. That's this 2004 Graham letter, um, which is on official stationery, has bears the seal of the United States, and it has a different date for notification. Um, and uh, my question is, my bottom line question about classic. The question of, we all agree, uh, well, I agree with you, it turns on notification. Notification is a question of fact. Here we have two documents that have two different notification dates. Now, you say that, um, you say in your brief that it speaks only of the dates of employment, but, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't say that he was employed between those dates. It says he was notified to the U.S. mission during that period. And and that's, and that's a technical term under the Vienna Convention. In fact, it, the phrase is virtually identical to paragraph 39, which says uh, if someone's already in the territory, from the moment his appointment is notified. So it, it just looks to me like we've got two competing letters here, both from the same office, both on the same letter different people, but one has a September date, one has a February date. Isn't that just a classic? So how can you grant summary judgment based on that, particularly since, well, why don't you just answer my question? Sure, Your Honor. So we don't know what purpose this Graham letter, the Graham letter was prepared for. We, it, it does not squarely address Ms. Muthana. It doesn't address uh, no, her it doesn't. birth. It addresses the question in this case. It, it, uh, no, respect. Okay. That's the question, isn't it? You agree. You agree with me, right? I, I think the official note. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Is the date of notification? That's the only question. Uh, uh, he, said if notification was in February, you win because uh, she was born while he was uh, a diplomat. Uh, so it all turns on notification, and what we have here is two competing pieces of evidence. Very strange, but how can you grant, particularly since we have to, we have to at this stage, uh, you know, give the benefit of the doubt to the plaintiff. How can we grant? How can, it, how can summary judgment be granted on this front? Yeah. Because it, that there, there are a couple reasons, Your Honor. Most centrally, I, I take your point about the mention of notification, but it doesn't. Uh, it does not address. The question of uh, notification of termination. It says that the person was notified for that those stretch of dates. But you don't have uh, to under the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention just says, I just read it to you. It just says, or if already in the territory, from the moment his appointment, it is notified to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That's all. 
It doesn't have to say termination. It just says notify. That's exactly the language from the Geneva Convention. And, and it says that during this period of time, he was recognized by the Department of State as entitled to full diplomatic immunity during that period of time. Which Correct. That he wasn't. He, which suggests that it wasn't after that time. Well, I, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not. I just don't understand how you can grant summary judgment on this record. Sure, Your Honor. I, I think I've got a couple more about this, this, uh, this letter and where it comes from. Understood on your concerns, Your Honor. Let me see if I can if I can answer those directly. Yeah. Um, the thing that I would notice that there there is a difference between. Um, notice of appointment and arrival uh, on the one hand and notification of final departure or termination of the functions. Article 10, uh, 1A of the Vienna Convention emphasizes those as different things. You need notification of, of, of all pieces or, or, or there's a requirement for notification of all pieces. So there is a question and this, the, the Donovan certification does address official notification of termination. The Graham letter does not address that piece, Your Honor. It speaks only to this other period. It, it doesn't squarely speak uh, to what happened after that period. So for, for all we know, it was Let me just- interrupt you. The, 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 the letter, uh, the other letter doesn't say anything more either. Um, he, Mr. Donovan's uh, certification, Your Honor? identical letters except for the date. They're not, Your Honor. The, the Donovan letter squarely says, and this, this is on page 18 of the Joint Appendix, on February 6, 1995, the United Nations provided the U.S. mission with official notification of Mr. Muthana's uh, termination from the Yemeni mission. Um, it also notes the notification of um, when he had been terminated, September of 94, and then it says, that Mr. Muthana and his family enjoyed diplomatic immunity until February 6, 1995. So it, it addresses yeah, the why, different dates. I still don't see why that's any different, why that's necessarily on its face inconsistent with the Graham letter. Uh, your, 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 the, the, your letter, the one you're relying on, the February letter, provides more information, but on the technical question of notification, they're inconsistent with each other. Your Honor, it, it's not that they're in, there's, there's not an inconsistency here. It's, it's that the Donovan Declaration is uh, there's not an inconsistency on any relevant question. The, the Donovan issue speaks more comprehensively to the breadth of issues presented to this court. The Graham letter is clipped and addresses only part of the features regarding Mr. Muthana, his, his termination, the notification, and his status. The Donovan, the Donovan certification speaks across the board of this is when official notification happened, this is when he had diplomatic immunity, and this is when it ended. The Graham letter doesn't purport to speak to those things. This is why there's not a dispute, Your Honor. Is it, I, I take Your Honor's point about um, what the Graham letter says. I'm just looking at it right now. It says, according to the information provided to us officially by the United Nations, our records, our records indicate that the plaintiff was notified to the United States mission as a diplomatic member from this period of time, which seems to me is what the Geneva Convention, as you properly interpret it, requires. Now, yes, the later letter, the Donovan letter, has more information, but on the technical question of notification, we have one that says it was notified for the period of time from September, and we have another letter that says it was notified for the period of time from February. And again, I think, Your Honor, th there would, like, it, it could, it, it could look like a different case if one letter said, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that this, that this would change under the law, but I, I'm saying what we don't have here, we don't have a Graham letter that says, uh, that says Mr. Muthana and his family uh, enjoyed diplomatic immunity until September 1st, 1994, and no longer thereafter. Well, but uh, there could clearly, uh, I mean, the way that it says during this period of time, he was recognized. That's not inconsistent with saying, <laughs> he wasn't recognized at that time. It, it, it's not inconsistent, Your Honor, but it also doesn't answer that question, and we do have a certification that does answer that question. And, and as I've tried to emphasize, Your Honor, I think under Baez and these certifications have a special status here, and we have this Donovan certification that squarely speaks to that dispositive issue of what the status was after that September 1st date when Ms. Muthana was born, and later when Mr. When Mr. Muthana was himself uh, Cease to have have 
uh, possess possess immunity. So I, I think the critical point is is, is your honor is that uh, there's no there's no conflict between the documents. It's it's on the on the relevant question. The Donovan certification just speaks conclusively to an issue that uh, the Graham letter does not address. And I take I, your I point, your honor. But... Uh, your, I, I... Mm -hmm. uh, right. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Sorry. Could I ask you a question about? standing about the next fund standing, which the government challenged below, but did not raise again here on appeal, but obviously we have a independent duty to assess uh, jurisdiction. Um, if we were to determine that Mr. Musana did not have next friend standing for his daughter, um, because she's not clearly covered by rule 17 um, and the factors in Whitmore, could we find that there was next friend standing for um, Mr. Musana's grandson, John Doe? I think... And would that allow us to reach the citizenship question of his mother? It's a good question, Your Honor. I, I'm, tr I'm trying to see as to whether we squarely uh, address that. I, I think potentially the issue, Your Honor, there is that I, I can't recall uh, this case is preceded essentially with 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 uh, John Doe is in somewhat of a derivative of status derivative status of, of Ms. Muthana, and I'm I'm trying to recall um, the allegations of standing and whether any have been made on behalf of, of, of John Doe. I, I think it's it's really focused on Ms. Muthana, so I, I don't. I, I don't have a. Uh, I, 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 I may need to think about that a little bit more, Your Honor. I'm not. I'm not certain of that. But it. I do think that's an important question. Whether the next friend standing question could be separated as to um, as to you know Ms. Musana and her son. Right, Your Honor. And my apologies for not recalling it. It's possible that that was addressed at some point. And I'm just not summoning it to mind, but. Um, I can look at it and we can, we can, if it would be useful to the court, we could submit, submit something on the point. Yeah, I, I would be interested to, to know the government's position on that question. Very good, Your Honor. And um, I mean, is it your position though that, I mean, do you still, I mean, why is the government not questioning the standing issue on um, appeal? I guess I'm interested why that argument was, uh, was put aside. Right, Your Honor. I, I, uh, I suppose that what I'll say is that we still think that we are right that there is a lack that that the district court um, could have appropriately granted dismissal for lack of next friend standing um, for each of the prongs we set forth and reasons we set forth in the district court. As is often the case, we we have not pressed that issue here. We could also ad address that too, but I, I do think the reasons we gave lack of adequate explanation, the fact that Ms. Muthana it seems to have access to Western media, gives interviews, that kind of a thing doesn't suggest that she's truly inaccessible and unable to proceed in her own name. There's some question about harmony of interest. So those are those are our questions. And uh, but we I, I don't know that I can say much more on uh, on why we haven't pressed those in, uh, in defense of the judgment below. Standing is more readily available for the grandson, given that he is a minor, and so would be within Rule 17, arguably. Got it, Your Honor. We can we can try to okay uh, address uh, address that, Your Honor. Any further questions? No questions. Okay. Uh, Ms. Trump, you used up all your time, but we'll give you uh, two minutes. Thank you, Your Honors. I appreciate that. Um, I would like to begin first by referring to the October 2004 letter. Um, we do know the purpose of that because at this stage we take Mr. Muthana's allegations as true and his affidavit states that he requested that letter in response to the Department of State asking him about the status of his diplomatic immunity at the time of Ms. Muthana's birth because he had applied for a passport for her. So because this was a motion to dismiss, which was then converted, at this stage we take her, his allegations as true on that fact. So we know exactly why this letter um, came to be. It was when he requested a letter to specifically to address his diplomatic immunity 
or his diplomatic status as of the time of her birth. I would also say, as I didn't mention earlier, we do have the um, claim on behalf of Mr. McDonough directly, uh, where he um, has specifically said to the FBI that he wants to be able to provide food and clothing for his, son, for his daughter and for his grandson. And he was specifically told by the FBI that if he does that, if he provides those specific items to these specific individuals in their current situation, uh, that he will be committing, um, he'll, he'll be in violation of 2339B and he would be um, charged with material support of terrorism for doing that. So this is not an advisory or hypothetical opinion. Finally, as to uh, Justice Rao's question regarding standing, um, again, uh, not surprisingly, we agree with the district court on its ruling on that issue, but I would say that we do assert in our complaint um, that uh, standing exists as to the minor child as well, and um, that you know, that requires examining uh, the citizenship of his mother since his citizenship would come from his mother's citizenship. If there is to be additional briefing on that, we don't believe it's necessary, but if there is to be any additional briefing on that subject, we would like the opportunity to do so as well. Uh, any further questions, Judge Ryan, on that issue? Um, no, I mean that that you know, it's your position that standing, um, if we have standing over uh, John Doe, we would be able to reach the citizenship question of Ms. Mutana since his citizenship yes, would be brought from that. Yes, right. Yes, Your Honor, it is. No further questions. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Jump, Mr. Stewart, thank you very much. The case is submitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honors. This honorable court is now adjourned until Tuesday, June 2nd at 9.30 a.m. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. We're sorry, your conference is ending now. Please hang up.